what a wonderful morning. What a great time of worship and a great time together. Our God is so good to us. Turn in your Bible, if you would, to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 6 through 11, and I'm going to try to move as quickly as I can because the Lord gave me a whole lot for today. And we don't have a lot of time to lollygag around and, and get it all in. So I want to read to you now from the book of Acts, chapter 1. We know that today is Resurrection Sunday. That our Lord rose, that he's no longer in the tomb, he's no longer in the grave. But I wonder if you think about the fact that, yes, we have Resurrection Day, the day that he rose from the tomb. But according to God's word, there was another day that he rose. We find that in the ascension here in the book of Acts. When the disciples were gathered around and they watched Jesus rise into the clouds. He had risen again. They, they saw that he had risen from the grave and now they see that he rises again and ascends to the Father in the glory of heaven in a cloud. And here in the book of Acts we're told about that ascension. Acts Chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Wow, can you imagine even seeing that? What that had to look like. And while they were gazing into the heaven, and he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go to heaven. I'm looking forward to that day. Amen? I can't wait to see him. Jesus rose from the grave in Luke chapter 24, and now he rises to the heavens in Acts chapter 1. I wonder if we think sometime for there to be a resurrection, there had to be a restriction. You see, that restriction was death. And death had no more power over our Lord Jesus Christ as he rose again. And sometimes I think about the disciples, and I think about the fact that they had spent so much time with Jesus. They had been together with Jesus. They, were, they had become his family with Jesus. They had shared experiences with him and hurts and pains and they had shared happy moments with him. And now for there to be a goodbye, sometimes goodbyes are hard. Goodbyes are difficult. I've shared with you before, I remember as a teenager, I went into the Navy right out of high school. And a week after I graduated high school, it was time for me to take off and pursue and, and fulfill my Navy obligation. And my father was going to take me down to the bus station and put me on the bus and head me down to El Paso. And from there, I caught a plane to San Diego to boot camp. And I remember standing in our carport and dad's in the car ready to take me to the bus station. And my little mother was standing at the door and she began to weep. She began to cry because her baby boy was going away. At the time, the Vietnam War was underway, and in her heart and in her mind, she had no idea whether she was going to see her boy again. And it was the first time that she had had to let go of me. And she realized that this was a final moment. It was a defining moment. And it was a moment that would forever change the existence of our life as a family. 
The very same thing was taking place when Jesus rose from the dead, and the very same thing took place in this meeting with Jesus and the disciples as he ascended into the heavens. The disciples, who were his family, didn't know what to think. They, he had just spent 40 wonderful days and nights together with them. He had shared with them the future and what was to come. He had shared with them what their goals and objectives should be, and now he's gone away. Their minds and their hearts were uncertain. Sometimes goodbyes are not only hard to say, but they come in an unexpected way. When I leave here today, I have to drive to another town, and I'll be doing a service for a highway patrolman who woke up one morning and went to work as usual, and his wife kissed him goodbye, never knowing and never dreaming that that was his final day on this earth. Goodbyes are sometimes unexpected. We don't know how to handle those unexpected difficulties in life. I love a saying that I read that said, if you're brave enough to say goodbye, God will reward you with a brand new hello. The disciples were caught unexpected and unawares by what Jesus was doing. I'd like to talk to you this morning about unfinished business. You see, when Jesus rose from the dead on that glorious resurrection day, when he ascended into the heavens in the cloud around his disciples, there was an unspoken message to them, and the same message is given to you and I today. Listen to me. We have unfinished finished business. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, the final words he spoke were, it is finished. You see, the plan of salvation was finished. But there's a continuing process in your life, in my life, in the life of our community, and in the life of our nation. We have unfinished business. Jesus gave very specific commands about the business that we were to be about. In verse 8 of our text, it says, Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. We have unfinished business, Christians. We have unfinished business, mothers and fathers. We have unfinished business, children. Jesus rose again, but he did not rise for no reason. He rose because there's unfinished business. The first thing I find in this passage of Scripture is we have an unfinished task to perform. We find that in verses 1 and 2. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. In that passage of Scripture, I'd like for you to pay attention to two very important words. Look at the word began. Just by saying began, that means that there's something else expected. Amen? It didn't say it was finished or it was completed, but in that passage of Scripture, he uses the word that he had just began. And for you and I, his resurrection from the dead is a beginning. The work continues. But then later on in that passage of Scripture, he says he gave us commandments. I met a young man this morning that serves in the army. And we shared a little bit together. And I'm an old Navy guy and a Coast Guard captain. And it's, it's always great to run into those people. But we are taught to understand commands. Amen? When we are given commands, they are an important issue that we can't overlook. We're supposed to pay attention to the commands. And in this passage of Scripture, it says clearly that it, the, the disciples were given commandments. That means there were certain commands 
that they were to follow, and those same commands are there for you and I today. I want you to know this morning that Jesus did not rise from the dead as an encore to his crucifixion. It was a preview of coming attractions. Amen? Jesus rose and there was a brand new beginning. It was restoration and regeneration and reconciliation and reconfirmation of life. The earthly ministry of Jesus was a manifestation of magnification in mankind. It was large. John chapter 14 verse 12 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that he that believeth in me and the works that I do shall he do also and greater, greater works than these. We have unfinished business. Amen? We have greater works that we're expected to perform. The business of Jesus was seeking and saving the lost. The business of Christians is sharing and serving our Savior. Our business will remain unfinished until He returns. Luke chapter 19 says, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Listen to me this morning. As long as there's one person who has not heard that Jesus Christ died for them. We have unfinished business. As long as there's one soul that's without a Savior, one heart that's hopeless, one spirit that's been subverted, one breath to breathe, we have unfinished business. The task of Jesus is a continuing work, and he entrusted his mission to you and to me. Matthew chapter 28 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Fanny Crosby wrote a song in 1869. We don't sing it very much anymore, but I remember as a kid, my sister's here with me, we used to sing it a lot in the old fuddy-duddy independent fundamental Baptist church we grew up in. The words to it says, to the work, to the work. We're servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master has trod. With the balm of his counsel, our strength to renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do. To the work, to the work. Let the hungry be fed. To the fountain of life, let the weary be led. In the cross and its banner, our glory will be while we herald the tidings. Listen, salvation is free. Men and women, boys and girls, singles and couples, young and old, rich and poor, red and yellow, black and white, resurrection is a reminder we have unfinished business. Unfinished business, our communities are uncertain. Our churches are uncommitted. Our children are unprepared. Our homes are unhealthy. Our nation is unrepentant. Our neighbors are unsaved. Souls are unconverted. Our service is unmotivated. And Jesus knew the value of his investment and he knew the value of his inventory. In John chapter 9, he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day, for the night cometh when no man can work. The resurrection and the ascension cry out to you and me. They cry out to people across our nation. They cry out to the entire world that yes, he is risen, but we have unfinished business. So there's an unfinished task for us, but secondly this morning, there's an unchallenged message to preach. In verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Key on that word infallible. There's some synonyms for that word infallible. Unerring, unfailing, faultless, flawless, perfect, precise, sound, sure, reliable, relentless, true, Trustworthy. Those are the infallible proofs that came from Jesus Christ. 
Those are the infallible things that his life taught to you and me. And those are the infallible proofs that he's risen again. He's infallible. My Jesus is an unchallenged messenger. Amen? And he's got an unchanging message. Liberalism is lame. Secularism, <laughs> suspect. Communism, progressivism. I, I preached a little bit last week about those of us who have the isms. But I'm so glad that the message of Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Modernism can't muck it up, and man can't mess it up. It's unchallenged. Jesus saves. Jesus secures us. Jesus sanctifies us. He justifies. He gratifies. He glorifies. And thank you, Lord, He purifies. Jesus is King of kings. He's Lord of lords. He's the Savior of the world. And His message is always consistent, and it's concise. Hebrews chapter 13 says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. 1 Peter 1.24, The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. The message of love and life and liberty is consistent. I praise you, Lamb of God, for your consistency, your unchallenged message, your unchanging grace. Notice with me this morning that society can't steal it. In the face of a, a faithless world that we still live in, the gospel lives on. The gospel still gives. The gospel still revives. And God's word still strives to touch mankind. Revelation 14, 6 says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them. Society can't steal it. Sin cannot separate it. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Society can't steal it, sin can't separate it, and Satan is stuck with it. Revelation 20 and verse 3, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. We have an unfinished task. We have an unchallenged message. And third of all, we have an unquestionable love to portray. In verse 3, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. Why do we call the movie the passion of the Christ? Because it was a depiction of his love on the cross of Calvary. That was his passion. His passion was the fact that he loved you and 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 me enough to go to the cross of Calvary. Oh, it's an unquestionable love. The love of Jesus. He separated himself from heaven. He lived a sinless life. He died a substitutionary death. He rose in supernatural power. And I want you to know he's coming again in supernal splendor. It's going to blow our mind when he breaks the eastern sky, when we see Jesus again. He's the author of the book of life, the agent of forgiveness, the appellate of grace, the antidote for sin, the ally for the faithful, an anchor for eternal life. His stripes have anointed my life. His thorns adorn me. His cross atones me, and his glory awaits me. Amen? His love is compelling. His love is overwhelming. His love is indwelling. One of my favorite hymns we sang this morning, O love of God. O love of God. I love the third verse of the, word of, uh, of the love of God. 
Let me read it for you. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. What a love. What a love. That's his passion. And we have that love to portray. We have unfinished business. Amen? So we have an unfinished task, an unchallenged message, an unquestionable love, but we also have an unmistakable plan to pursue. We find that in verse 8. And ye shall be witnesses. What is a witness? A witness gives testimony to the truth. A witness tells the facts of a situation that they are privy to. And the words of a witness are given great power in our courts and amongst men. Because witnesses are expected to speak the truth. What was seen? What was shared? What was significant about the event? Who is substantive? Witnesses have a, a first-hand knowledge. Now I want you to pay attention to something this morning. As Christians, we're not expected to be super salesmen for Christ. We're commanded to be a wonderful witness. Someone who can talk from first-hand knowledge and experience from being with Him, from spending time with Him, from looking at what He does in our life, that we can give a witness, a testimony to His goodness and His grace and His mercy and His love and His glorious love. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16 says, Let your light so shine. That's what a witness does. We don't necessarily go out and hammer them with a Bible. We're not to proselyte them with our personal ideas of what religion ought to be. But love would listen. God should have done something in your life. You should not be the same today as you were yesterday. The mercies and the grace that He's shown to you are a witness. They're a testimony to others that there's hope. There's peace. There's a chance. Loved ones, listen. We're to be a witness. A witness for Jesus Christ. I find that in His perfect plan, in verse 8, He points out, "Ye shall be witnesses to Me. Listen to how He does this. It's important. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Now let me break that down for you. Jerusalem is home. It's the close-in place. Judea travels outward. That's our community. Samaria is even further out. That's our nation. And then the uttermost part of the world means it's limitless. That's where we're supposed to be a witness. So we have an unfinished task, an unchallenged message, an unquestionable love, an unmistakable plan, and number five, we have an unshakable testimony that we need to protect. Verse 10. While they looked steadfastly toward the heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Jesus lifts us up with an unshakable testimony. It's a testimony of faith and hope and love and peace and eternal life, and Satan can't shake it. The Sanhedrin couldn't separate it. The cross settled it, the resurrection cinched it, and the ascension sealed it. I have a question this morning. How's your testimony? Are others seeing Him 
in you? Are they seeing his love and his grace and his mercy and his assurance? Has he lifted you up? Are you a witness? Do you have an unshakable testimony or is your testimony suspect? Do they hear you talk about going to church and look at your life and get confused? That's a problem. If that's happening, we've got a problem with our testimony. Amen? They should look at us and see a consistency of Jesus in us. 1 John 3, 3 says, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And Romans 12 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, what? A living, living sacrifice. Every day that we live, that's holy, acceptable unto him. And then it says, that's just my reasonable service. My business is to be about his business. Amen? I need a testimony that's unblemished, untarnished, unshakable. So I have an unfinished task. I have an unchallenged message. I have an unquestionable love. I have an unmistakable plan. I have an unshakable testimony. And I have an unstoppable force to project. Verse 11 says, Ye men of Galilee, it was all inclusive. Notice the progression of God's force. He began as a child in the manger. He moved to a Savior on the cross. It culminated as a risen Lord, and it commenced to these disciples in the ascension. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 says, They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what happened. That's what happens when we take our unfinished business and we convert it to his finished business. We have a personal challenge that's given to each one of us in this passage of Scripture. Go into all the world. Acts chapter 4 says, When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled, and they were all filled. With the Holy Ghost. And then look what happened after they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They all spoke the Word of God with boldness. That's what happens. There's a progression of God's force, and it's always powerful, it's always purposeful, and it's always plentiful. And this church that experienced the power of God in Acts chapter 2, there were 3,000 saved. And then if we go over to Acts chapter 4, there were 5,000 added to the 3,000. That's power. We have a personal challenge. And when we're in love with Jesus, the love of Jesus is unstoppable. Acts 4.13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. People saw something different in these men who had been with Jesus. And listen to me this morning. When you spend time with Jesus, people are going to see something different in you. And they're going to see something different in me. Their foes couldn't stop them, couldn't suppress them. They became an unstoppable force. Satan tried, and instead of securing them, Saul just scattered them. In Acts at chapter 8, verse 3, it says, As for Saul, he made a havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Listen, the Christian life is not an easy life. And if you're looking for all roses and cherries and sweetness and never having any problems and never having any circumstances in your life, you better get on with it. Amen? It's not going to happen, but we have his power to overcome them. And when Satan attacked this church and Saul went to imprison the Christians, instead of scattering them about in the prisons, he scattered them about in public. And they began to speak the word of God with boldness and with power. Unchallenged message, unquestionable love, an unmistakable plan, an unshakable testimony, an unstoppable force, and lastly this morning, 
We have an unfailing promise to protect. In verse 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner. That's an unfailing promise. Jesus is coming again. He rose from the grave. He rose in the ascension on the clouds, and he's coming back in great glory. In the South Pacific in World War II in the Philippines, General Douglas MacArthur had suffered a tremendous defeat. His men had been pummeled and crushed. And for the very first time in his career, he found it necessary to retreat. And he pulled his forces back, and as they mounted upon the airplanes and loaded into various vehicles to take them out to the ships and leave, General MacArthur made a statement to the people in the Philippines. He said, I will be back. Six months later, the people in the Philippines heard the sound of airplane engines. They looked up in the sky to see an entire squadron of airplanes, and they landed in the Philippines, and Douglas MacArthur got off and said, I have returned. Amen? Listen to me. General MacArthur was a great man. But he doesn't touch my Jesus. He can never come close to my Jesus. And it was such a wonderful thing when he said, I will return. And it was great when he landed and he said, I am back. But I want you and me to remember, we have a Lord Jesus Christ that told us, I will return. And his word is sure. And his word is positive. And his word is purposeful and we need to remember that he's coming again and we're going to see him praise God he rose from the dead but we have an unfailing promise and we need to perfect it and it'll be perfected on his return and though many things attack our life and attack our families and attack our children and attack our church we need to remember our Lord is large and in charge and he's coming again Jesus said I'll be back John chapter 14 verse 1 let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house there are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you here's the part I love and if I go I will come again and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's God's unfailing promise, and it's our unfinished business. First Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we which were alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So I want to leave us with a reminder. David, you got unfinished business, brother. Brother, Miss Cash, you got unfinished business. Sister, you got unfinished business. We all have unfinished business until our Jesus comes again. He expects these things of us. He expects that his message will be carried forth. He expects that we're performing the task, that we're preaching the message that we're portraying His love, that we're pursuing the plan, that we're protecting our testimony, that we're projecting His force, and most importantly, most importantly this morning, have you perfected His promise? Because you see, everything else that we've covered this morning is meaningless unless you personally have protected His promise. And unless you perfected it in your heart, and in your life. And you've accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, and you can look for Him to return again one day. Have you perfected His promise in your life? Simply, I close with a passage of Scripture that probably every one of us know. 
But it covers the entirety of everything that we've discussed this morning. It wraps it up, and it puts a real pretty bow right on the top of it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Christian, if you've accepted him, we have unfinished business. But if you're here this morning and you have never accepted him as your Savior and you cannot point to that time that you ask him to be your Lord and to come into your life and to change you and to handle your circumstances and to carry your burdens and to be your Lord and to be your all in all, then you've got some unfinished business and you better do it this morning. You need to take care of it. Maybe you've spoken to your heart and said, I have a place that I want you to serve. You better take care of that. That's unfinished business. If you've never followed him in scriptural baptism, that's unfinished business. Don't leave here this morning without completing the task that Jesus has given to you and to me. He's glorious. He's victorious. He has risen. He rose in the ascension and he calls you and me to be faithful to our unfinished business. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love that secures us and sanctifies us and changes us and makes us new again. Father, I thank you for that glorious day that Jesus rose again. And that he lives. And he lives for us. Because he loves us. Father, if there's one person here this morning who doesn't know you, if there's one person here who hasn't accepted you, Father, I ask you to speak to their heart. Give them the strength and the courage they need to move and react and accept you and look to you to be the Savior of their life. Those that are here that are hurting, Father, may be carrying heavy loads and burdens. There's people that are sick and afflicted. That life is just caving in on them and hammering them with problems. Father, would you let them know your grace is sufficient? And that if they'll just trust in you, that, Father, you'll do a work in them that's indescribable. Lord, until you return to take your children home, please help us be about your unfinished business. And help us take those tasks that you've given us and apply them to our heart because you love us. And I ask you in faith, believing in the precious name of my Jesus.